My father was the son of immigrants. He was born in the United States. Both of my parents, uh, uh, parents came from Europe. Uh, they were both born in the United States. And my father uh, served in the South Pacific in the Army, uh, fought in New Guinea and the Philippines. Both my parents, who worked very hard to ensure that I got a proper liberal education, you know, with a small, a liberal with a small L, that I, I spent my time learning things because being well educated would stand me a good stead later on, and they were absolutely correct. Jack Jacobs went through ROTC at Rutgers University. When he graduated in 1966, he was commissioned as an officer in the U.S. Army. He wanted to deploy to Vietnam with his unit, the 82nd Airborne, but was chosen instead to go as an advisor. So I called up the infantry branch and I said, listen, you got to cancel my orders to go as an advisor. I, w I don't want to be an advisor. I want to be an infantry soldier with my, my unit that's going. And I said, well, you're not going. And I said, why not? They said, well, because we need advisors. Well, go find somebody else to be. No, no, you're uniquely qualified. I said, in what way am I uniquely qualified to be an advisor to Vietnamese units? He said, well, you got a college degree, and hung up the phone, and that was the end of that. Jacobs arrived in Vietnam in 1967. We got off, and going onto the plane were these soldiers who looked like they were 100 years old. As they're getting on, they're getting on the plane yelling to us, you'll be sorry. And, uh, but they looked old. They were only 19, 20, 21 years old. And uh, in about eight weeks, I was, I was 100 years old too. I looked just like them. In March of 1968, Jacobs was serving as an advisor to a South Vietnamese battalion. They had fought through the Tet Offensive and for months had been pursuing a large number of enemy units. Province headquarters received apparently some intelligence information that said that the headquarters of the enemy unit we've been chasing and fighting for two months was located at some specific place. And the idea was to mount a really big, very major operation to annihilate the bad guys once and, once and for all. My battalion, the 2nd of the 16th, was going to land on the north bank of the Basak River from river assault boats and then move north in the direction of this specific spot where we thought the enemy headquarters was located. Simultaneously, helicopters would insert either the 41st or the 43rd Ranger Battalion, also Vietnamese, in a point, a landing zone that was to the east of this objective, and then we would move perpendicular to one another and close in on the bad guys uh, from two separate directions. Now, what we didn't know was that the enemy had one or more um, informants in the province chief's headquarters. So they knew we were coming. They knew when we were coming. And as a result, they had plenty of opportunity to dig big positions and establish a huge L-shaped ambush. Well, the scouts, I think, kept on telling the battalion commander that they were that they were forward and they were to the flanks, but in fact, they weren't anything of the kind. I have, to this day, I have no idea where they were. I suspect they were to the rear. Um, maybe they knew we were gonna walk into this enormous ambush, but walk into it, we did. We had an entire battalion, and certainly the two lead companies, caught in the open in a kill zone. Mortars exploding, rifle and machine gun fire, and we lost, I don't know, 75 or more men killed or wounded in the first 10, 15 seconds of the battle. I was wounded in the initial part of the ambush by mortar fragments. And my NCO, Ray Ramirez, uh, was also, was badly wounded. He had three sucking chest wounds. And uh, I had a head wound. And I remember his picking up the handset of the radio, calling back to uh, uh, our boss who was a major, a different major than the one I was talking about before, called back to our boss, who is now the senior advisor with the battalion commander, slightly to the rear, telling him that 3-2 uh, Alpha, that was my call sign. He said, this is 3-2 Charlie, that was him. He said, 3-2 Alpha, that's me, uh, is hit real bad and I don't think he's gonna make it. And then he falls over from his wounds. So I pick up the handset and I said, this is 3-2 Alpha, 
3-2 Charlie has hit real bad, and I don't think he's going to make it. And the boss says, what is this, a comedy routine? You guys get to work. Unfortunately, I was badly wounded, too, and I was losing a lot of blood. So, but I didn't realize it at the time. I knew I was wounded, but I didn't think I was as badly wounded as I was. And so I set about doing what anybody else would do in the same situation. You have to, you have to kill the bad guys, and you have to save the good guys. Jacobs called for and directed airstrikes on the enemy. But their well-entrenched positions and the intensity of their fire drove off the U.S. fighters. With casualties mounting, including the company commander, the troops began to panic. There are a couple of things that go through your mind. The first is that if you're going to, uh, if you're going to stay where, you're all, where you are, you're going to die. The uh, second thing was my perception that uh, that I was probably the only guy in a position to do anything, that everybody else was so thoroughly incapacitated that they couldn't act. The third was the perception that this was a genuine crisis and something had to be done, even if it's wrong. And uh, finally, what went through my mind was the, old, uh, was the old observation by Hillel, the great Hebrew scholar. And I'll paraphrase it because it doesn't even come out very, it doesn't come out recognizable, even if you translate it from Hebrew to English. But he said effectively, if not you, who? And if not now, when? Jacobs took command, ordering a withdrawal from the exposed position and establishing a defensive perimeter. Despite profuse bleeding from head wounds that impaired his vision, Jacobs returned under intense fire to evacuate a seriously wounded advisor to a wooded area where he administered life-saving first aid. Then he returned yet again to evacuate the wounded company commander. And then spent what seemed like the better part of 30 years, but was actually only a couple of hours, trying to get the uh, wounded guys into safe areas because the, uh, the enemy was coming out of its bunkers and taking weapons and shooting the wounded and so on. And it was, But that also made them vulnerable. And I remember then what I had learned some months before, that if they were aligned in, along a canal, that they were, uh, it, was, it was a linear defense and if I could get to the side of it, I'd be able to, I'd be able to defeat, defeat the bad guys with the, uh, with, with that as, as much danger as I otherwise would. So I went to the side and started rolling up their flank, but then that, until such time as it gave me enough room to evacuate some of the wounded guys. But it seemed like, it seemed like a long, long time, but it was really only a couple of hours. Jacob single-handedly saved the lives of one U.S. advisor and 13 Allied soldiers. The ceremony took place 16, 18 months after the action. It was on a glorious day, early fall day. President Nixon uh, was the president at the time who, who rendered the award, but the Secretary of Defense was there, Secretary of Army, the Army was there, and so on. I was shocked by the sea of people on the White House grounds. They had given off government workers to come to the ceremony, had opened out the White House gates. Anybody who wanted to could come on to the White House grounds, and there were times have changed, haven't they? And you could see nothing but people as far as you could see on this sparkling day, and that was the most shocking thing about the entire ceremony. I remember he asked me if I was nervous. And I said, uh, no, sir, I'm not. And I, I remember seeing beads of sweat on his upper lip. <laughs> and I came to the conclusion that he was nervous. Particularly to people who are already serving, uh, I start off and I finish by telling them how grateful uh, we all are for their service. It's difficult to convey to people who are in something of an isolated atmosphere. I mean, if you're in the service, you're doing service stuff all the time. It's not that you don't have very much contact with the outside world, but you certainly don't have contact with the outside world with people saying thank you. So I think it's my obligation to carry the message to these kids that they are doing a good job and that everybody, if they possibly could, would thank them. To young people who are not in the service, it's something of a different message. And that is that we all do have a responsibility to do what we can to defend the republic. And again, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to 
take up a weapon, fix bayonets, and charge the enemy. There are lots of things that all of them and all of us can do to defend the Republic in our communities. And we need to think about how we can do that. You don't have to be in the Army, the Air Force, the Navy, the Marines, and the Coast Guard to, uh, to serve freedom. You can do that in your community, and that's one of the messages I try to give to kids. They need to, be, they need to look for ways to serve their communities and to be satisfied with what they've done and be proud of what they've done to serve.